Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Scholes. Today we have part nine in our story of our son, captured by Countess Sophie de Segur. It's a French fairy tale that if you have not heard the first eight parts, you're, you're going to want to go back and catch up because especially this part is not going to make any sense. Now, for those of you who are all caught up, we last left the story with our son being killed. He had rushed into a house engulfed in flames to capture the happiness of Violet. Well, thankfully, Countess de Segur is not leaving us hanging with the fate of our son. That we find out today. This is The Well. Aniela, Violet, and Pat's Rose walked slowly toward the burned walls of the farmhouse. With the courage of despair, they removed the smoking ruins. They worked diligently two days before this work was completed. No vestige of our son appeared, and yet they had removed piece by piece, handful by handful, all that covered the site. On removing the last half-burned planks, Violet perceived an aperture, which she quickly enlarged. It was the orifice of a well. Her heart beat violently. A vague hope inspired it. Our son, she cried with a faint voice. Violet, dear Violet, I'm here, I'm saved. Violet could reply only a smothered cry. She lost her consciousness and fell into the well which enclosed her dear our son. If the good fairy Drolette had not watched over her fall, She would have broken her head and her limbs against the side of the well, but their kind protectress, who had already rendered them so many services, sustained her, and she fell safely at our son's feet. Violet soon returned to consciousness. Their happiness was too great to be believed in, to be trusted. They did not cease to give the most tender assurances of affection, and now they were aroused from their ecstasy by the cries of Passrose, who, Losing sight of Violet and seeking her amongst the ruins, discovered the open well. Peering into the darkness, she saw Violet's white robe, and she imagined that the poor girl had thrown herself intentionally into the well, and there found the death she sought. Bass Rose screamed loud enough to destroy her lungs. Aniela came slowly forward to know the cause of this alarm. Be silent, Pass Rose, cried our son in a loud voice. You are frightening our mother. I am in the well with Violet. We are happy and want for nothing. Oh, blessed news, blessed news, cried Pass Rose. I see them, I see them. Madam, madam, come quickly, quickly. They are here, they are well. They have need of nothing. Aniela, pale and half dead with emotion, listened to Pass Rose without comprehending her. She fell on her knees and had not strength to rise. But when she heard the voice of her dear our son calling to her, Mother, mother, your poor our son still lives, she sprang toward the well. She would have precipitated herself within had not Pass Rose seized her by the arms and drawn her back suddenly. For the love of our son, dear queen, do not throw yourself into this hole. You will kill yourself. I will restore our son and Violet to you unharmed. Aniela, trembling with happiness, comprehended the wisdom of the counsel given by Passrose. She remained rooted to the spot, but shuddering with agitation while Passrose ran to seek a ladder. Passrose was absent a long time, which was excusable, as she was somewhat confused. First, she seized a cord, then a pitchfork, then a chair. For an instant, she thought of lowering the cow to the bottom of the well so that poor Arson might have a drink of fresh warm milk. At last, She found the ladder before her eyes, almost in her hands, but she had not seen it. While Pass Rose was seeking the ladder, Arson and Violet talked incessantly of their present happiness and the despair and anguish which they had endured. I passed uninjured through the flames, said Arson, and sought groping about for the wardrobe of my mother. The smoke suffocated and blinded me. Then I felt myself raised by the hair and cast to the bottom of this well where you have come to join me, my dear Violet. In place of finding water or even moisture here, I felt at once a sweet fresh air. A soft carpet was spread at the bottom. You see, it is still here. There was 
from some source sufficient light around me. I found ample provisions at my side. Look at them, Violet. I have not touched them. A few drops of wine was all that I could swallow. The knowledge of your despair and that of my mother rendered me too unhappy, and the fairy Drolette took pity on me. She appeared to me under your form, dear Violet, and I took her for you, and sprang forward to seize you in my arms, but I embraced only a vague form of air or vapor. I could see her, but I could not touch her. Ah, son, said the fairy, smiling sweetly upon me. I have assumed Violet's form to testify my friendship in the most agreeable way. Be comforted. You shall see her tomorrow. She weeps bitterly because she believes you to be dead, but I will send her to you tomorrow. She will make you a visit at the bottom of this well. She will accompany you when you go forth from this tomb, and you shall see your mother and the blue heavens and the dazzling sun, which neither your mother nor Violet wish to look upon since your loss, but which appeared beautiful to them while you were with them. You will return once more to this well, for it contains your happiness. My happiness, I exclaimed to the fairy. When I have found my mother and my Violet, I shall be in possession of all my happiness. Believe implicitly what I say. This well contains your happiness and that of Violet. Violet's happiness, madam, is to live with me and my mother. Ah, you replied well, interrupted Violet. But what said the fairy? I know what I say, she answered. In a few days something will be wanting to complete your happiness. You will find it here. We will meet again, our son. Remember what I have said. Yes, madam. I hope it will be soon. When you see me again, my poor child, you will be scarcely content, and then you will wish that you had never seen me. Silence and farewell. She flew away, smiling sweetly, leaving behind her a delicious perfume and an atmosphere so soft and heavenly that it diffused a peaceful calm in my heart. I suffered no more. I expected you. Violet, on her part, comprehended better than our son why the next return of the fairy would be painful to him. Since Aniela had revealed to her in confidence the nature of the sacrifice that she could impose upon herself, she was resolved to accomplish it, in spite of the opposition of our son. She thought only of the delight of giving an immense proof of her affection. This hope tempered her joy at having found him. When our son had completed his narrative, they heard the shrill voice of Passrose crying out to them, Look, my children, look, the ladder. I will put it down to you. Take care that it does not fall on your heads. You must have some provisions down there. Send them up, if you please. We are somewhat destitute above here. For two days I have only had a little milk to drink and a crust. Your mother and Violet have lived upon the air and their tears. Softly, softly. Take care not to break the ladder. Madam, madam, here they are. Here are our sons and Violet's heads. Good. Step up. There you are. Aniela, still pallid and trembling, was immovable as a statue. Having seen Violet in safety, our son sprang from the well and threw himself into his mother's arms. She covered him with tears and kisses and held him a long time clasped to her heart. After having thought him dead during so many painful hours, it seemed a dream to her, almost impossible to realize that she was holding him safe once more. Finally, Pass Rose terminated this melting scene by seizing our son and saying to him, Now it is my turn. I am forgotten forsooth because I do not bathe myself in tears, because I keep my head cool and preserve my strength. Was it not Pass Rose, after all, who got you out of that terrible hole? Speak the truth. Yes. Yes, my good pass, Rose. You may believe that I love you, and indeed I thank you for drawing me out of it, where, however, I was doing very well after my sweet Violet came down to me. But now I think of it, said pass, Rose. Tell me, Violet, how did you get to the bottom of that well without killing yourself? I did not go down purposefully. I fell, and our son received me in his arms. Oh, this is not very clear, said pass, Rose. The fairy Drolette had something to do with it. Yes, the good and amiable fairy, said our son. She is always counteracting the cruelties of her wicked sister. While thus talking merrily, their stomachs gave indication that they were suffering for dinner. Our son had left in the well the provisions furnished by the fairy. The rest of the happy family were still embracing and weeping over the past remembrances, but Pass Rose, without saying a word, descended into the well and remounted with the provisions which she placed on a bundle of straw. She then placed around the table four other bundles of straw for seats. Dinner is ready, 
said she. Come and eat. You all need food. The good queen and Violet shall soon fall from exhaustion. Our son has had a little wine, but he has eaten nothing. Here's a pie, a ham, bread, and wine. Long life to the good fairy. Agnella, Violet, and our son did not require to be told a second time, but placed themselves gaily at the table. Their appetites were good, and the repast excellent. Happiness illuminated every countenance. They talked, laughed, and clasped each other's hands, and were in paradise. When dinner was over, Pass Rose was surprised that the fairy Drolette had not provided for all their wants. Look, said she, the house is in ruins. We are destitute of everything. The stable is our only shelter, the straw our only bed, and the provisions I brought up from the well our only food. Formerly everything was provided before we had time to ask for it. Agnella looked suddenly at her hand. The ring was no longer there. They must now gain their bread by the sweat of their brows. Our son and Violet, seeing an air of consternation, demanded the cause of it. Alas, my children, you will no doubt think me very ungrateful to feel disquieted about the future in the midst of our great happiness, but I perceive that during the fire I have lost the ring given to me by the good fairy, and this ring would have furnished us with all the necessities of life so long as it was upon my finger. Alas, I have it no longer. What shall we do? Dismiss all anxiety, dear mother, said our son. Am I not tall and strong? I will seek for work, and you can all live on my wages. And I, too, said Violet. Can I not assist my good mother and pass Rose? In seeking work for yourself, our son, you can also find something for me to do. I will go at once and seek work, said our son. Adieu, mother. We will meet again, Violet. Kissing their hands, he set off with a light step. He had no presentiment, poor boy, of the reception which awaited him in the three houses where he sought employment. And that is part nine of the story of our son, the well. We're lucky, at least Countess de Segur, while she's amazing with these cliffhangers, such as we found on Wednesday in the conflagration, she does resolve them quickly. We don't have to wait a few passages to find out. We find out right away that our son has survived at the hands of the good fairy Drolet. Next week, our son is going to take on some more tasks, some more challenges, and continue to prove himself. This is Dan Scholes for The Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Next week, we'll be back with part 10. The farm, the castle, the forge. As always, thank you so much for listening.